Hi, welcome everyone to Cascades 101 or Jam 308. Uh, so glad to see all of you here. Um, this is the introduction to Cascades. Just get to know us so you know who to ask questions. I'm uh, Jonas Knutsson. Uh, I work in the Sweden office, uh, the former TAT office. Uh, I'm leading a group of uh, expert Cascades developers. And this is Marcus. Yeah, so my name is, um, is the mic on? Yeah. So my name is Marcus Landin, and I'm product manager at BlackBerry. And I'm also from the old TAT office in, in Malmö. Um, yeah. So, the agenda for today. Uh, it will be, we have a lot of content to show you. We'll move pretty fast. We'll show you most introduction stuff. Uh, we'll show you a little bit of code and a few examples. We start with an introduction of what Cascades is, for you who don't know. Then we will go into uh, controls, all the core controls and stuff like that in Cascades. Uh, then we're going to deep dive into the architecture of Cascades, how it's built up and how it works behind the scenes. Uh, we're going to talk about animations. We have a very powerful animation framework, which is very easy to use. We're going to touch briefly on events and how we can use it, how you can use touch events in your, in your apps. Uh, we're going to explain the layout system, how you can lay out your controls in your app. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you do your own custom controls if you want to use stuff outside of the core controls. I'm going to go through lists in Cascades and finally UI adaptability if you want to uh, want your app to work on both C10 and Q10 and whatever might come after that. Then you get to go for coffee. <laughs> All right, first what, what is Cascades? Um, Cascades is the UI framework for native development on BlackBerry 10. It's not a UI framework, it's the UI framework. Um, what you get from Cascades is you get a bunch of core controls. What you see here, like you get, um, you get sidebars and action bars and uh, context menus and you get sharing frameworks uh, and it all looks beautiful out of the box. You don't need to do much to make that work. Uh, you get QML, which is our declarative language for declaring your UI, uh, which is a very powerful, uh, powerful language, uh, and it also handles JavaScript, so you, almost, you can almost avoid C++ completely if you want to. Um, you get out-of-the-box elegance. You get everything will look good for you automatically. Everything will fit together. Everything will move smoothly. Uh, and you get a bunch of core stuff that you can use. But not only that, you will also get the freedom, as I mentioned, to do your own custom stuff. Um, things that are a bit outside of the core stuff, for example, pull my beard. Um, you can easily do that with the Cascades uh, UI framework. So just to show you briefly what, where we fit into the whole picture. BlackBerry 10 is built on the Cunix OS. That gives us a real-time OS that I'm sure you know it's used everywhere in the nuclear power plants and on the moon and uh, ships and cars. Uh, it gives us a real reliable real-time OS. On top of that, we built the platform APIs and they, we built them using the Qt framework. We use the Qt framework because it's, it's a very stable, well-proven, very mature, application framework. We got a lot of stuff for free. And we didn't just want to do that from the start. We want to use something that's good. Uh, and what you will get from that is you get a bunch of, a bunch of health classes, a bunch of uh, functionality that's already there. You get signals and slots, most of all, which is a great way, a very easy way of handling uh, asynchronous uh, communication. On top of that, we have the Cascades UI framework. And the features that you will use, you will use the UI framework and, uh, and the Qt framework. Uh, basically, we 
we removed the Qt GUI from, from the Qt framework and uh, replaced it with Cascades. And on top of that, there are you. So, you see, we're almost there already. <laughs> okay, so like, like any UI framework, Cascades UI framework work comes with a set of built-in controls. And so the Cascades UI controls, they, they are the ones that, that will give your native application that look and feel that is really the, the BlackBerry 10 user experience. Um, so, and we're going to, to look at these controls, and, but first let, let's look at, let's say that you want to create that very simple Hello World application. What would that look like uh, in Cascades? Uh, and let's start with, with the QML. So as Jonas mentioned, we are using QML. That is something that comes from, that comes with Qt. It's a declarative markup language. And here in this Hello World example, we take the page control, which I will get back to later, as the root UI object. In this page control, you put the label control, which you give the, uh, the title Hello World. And the way you get this to be presented on the screen is that in your C++ code, you, you give this QML file to Cascades and then Cascades render this uh, on, onto the screen. So and what, one of the great things with QML is that th this is very toolable. So, so in our development environment, uh, Momentix, we also have a, a preview. So, it's, so when you work with QML this way, you will also have a window where you can see the UR that you are coding in, in QML. Uh, which will give you these fast visual feedback uh, iteration loops. So you can, of course, do these things in C++ as well. And this is the C++, uh, C++ uh, version of the exact same thing. So you would go ahead and create the page control as the root node. You would create the label control and set the text, add that as the child node to the page control, and that, then give the scene to Cascades, and Cascades would render it. So, so as you can see here, you can do the same things in QML as you can do in C++ when it comes to the UI. So, so where, when would you go ahead and choose QML and when would you go ahead and choose C++? And we, it's, it's very much about a matter of preference. I've seen applications completely built using QML and with JavaScript within those QML files as well. Uh, but I've also seen applications completely built using C++. We usually give the recommendation that go ahead and use QML and, and JavaScript for the, the UI appearance and the UI logic, and then the business logic, the application logic implemented in C++. Uh, but again, it's, it's very much about a matter of preference. Um, yeah, and you've all seen demos. Uh, you, you've all seen the UI of the Z10 device. Today at the keynote, they, they showed a lot of different applications using the Cascades UI. So, but what do these things mean in terms of concrete Cascades UI components, concrete Cascades UI controls? So the first important one, yeah, uh, so this is what I call the application structure controls. These are kind of the, the backbone of, the, um, of, of an application UI built with Cascades. And the first one is the page controls. So, and this kind of corresponds to a screen in, in an application. And this page can have an action bar, uh, and the action bar has actions. So in this example, it, ha it has a search action, it has a compose action. In this application, there are more than just one page. It has several pages. So if you would go ahead and, and click here to the left, you would get what we call the tab menu. So this shows all the different pages you have in this application and the user can go ahead and, and choose which page to, to navigate to. And another interesting menu here is the action menu. So if you would have more actions than fit in the action bar, these would be shown and displayed in this action menu. And if you have actions that are specific to, to the list items, let's say that you would go ahead and, and long press a list item, you get the context menu. So here you have all the actions that go with the items in, in your list. Um, another important application structure control is the navigation pane. So, so, so this gives you the, this implements the, the navigation logic for your application. So if you have, uh, if you want to navigate from, from the first screen to the other screen, go ahead, use the navigation pane, and you get 
things like this navigation transition animation for free built in with uh, this navigation uh, pane control. Uh, you've also heard a lot about the, the Blackberry flow, the peak feature and so on. The peak feature is also something that you get with this navigation pane control. So if you have a stack of pages, use your thumb to peek back into the, to the stack of pages you have. Um, so again, I mean, th this is, I, I've, I've spoken with developers today who say that I, I have applications since before now I want to have a really good looking Blackbird 10 experience in my application. And I, I'm not a designer or anything, I just want things to look good. I would say that these controls here, they give you a lot of things for free, to, so to say. Um, so uh, yeah, things like this. And in addition to these application structure controls, we, also, we obviously have things you would expect from, from any UI framework. We have the labels, the buttons, toggle buttons, checkbox, radio group, daytime pickers, and image views, and so on. And I realize I, I don't have the, the web view here, but we obviously have the web view um, as well. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, if, if you want something else than the, the controls that comes out of the box with Cascades, you can implement your own custom controls, which Jonas will talk about later in this presentation. Um, so yeah, and now over to, to you, Jonas, to talk about the, the inside of Cascades a little bit. Yes, if, because before, you, before we get, get to learn, teach you how to use custom controls, which you probably will end, end up using at some point, I'd like to show you how it works behind the scenes because that's, it's important to understand. So, so this, is the, this is the design vision for Cascades, formulated in five letters. Um, the whole goal of Cascades was to always guarantee 60 FPS. When you go below 60 FPS, it, your UI starts feeling clunky and uh, uh, and choppy, and you get choppy animations, and it doesn't look good. So we, we need to guarantee 60 FPS at all times. Uh, and we, we, had, we had two, two major features to reach this. I'm going to go through them. The first one is a client-server architecture. I have two slides explaining the same thing here because it's so hard to draw something that looks good. Uh, I'm going to go through it. Uh, basically, we have a client thread. This is where your application is. All your application code is in the client thread. We have a server thread, which is where Cascades resides. You cannot do anything in the server thread. The server thread renders all your UI. And it kind of goes like this. Via QML or via C++, you tell the server what to render. For example, you say, start my animation. And the server will start your animation for you. And in the, in the meantime, you can do whatever you want. The server will handle all, like, all the rendering, all the events. So when a user taps something, or, or long presses something, or clicks, or swipes anywhere, you will get the event back from the server. The server will keep on rendering. And for example, if, if the user swipes in a list, uh, it will not wait for you to respond to that event. The server will, will allow the user to, to navigate through a list while you do whatever you need to do in your application code. So this is, this is kind, kind of to stop you from stopping the rendering. Um, there is, there's still things you can do, for example, uh, if you wait for data and not start animations and not start stuff in time, but this is what we do to guarantee these 60 FPS. <coughs> I show in this slide, here are the two threads again, your application thread and cascade thread. So a few examples. Uh, when you tap here, your application gets to react, and the server just continues. Or if you scroll a list, uh, maybe you need to start fetching data. Uh, and you will get a signal to do that, but the, the server will still scroll the list. It, it will, you will not interrupt the server. Or for example, you want to start an animation of this cow. Uh, so you want to start rotating the cow. Um, and then do something else. And you can do whatever you want here, whatever complicated calculation or fetching Facebook data or, or, or whatever. This will keep on animating smoothly. 
just like PowerPoint does it. So that was the server client. The other part is we use a scene graph. Um, this is something that that's used in 3D engines, in games. Um, th this is something we do to, to, uh, to get that really high performance, and it differs from other UI frameworks. Uh, basically, it works like this. You see this, uh, these two examples? Uh, in order to get from there to there, this one is built up using a root container. We, you always start with the container. You have a background image here, and you have a bubble uh, with the hello world. That bubble is in itself constructed of a container, again, containing a bubble and the text hello world. And when you then apply something on that uh, top container, it, it applies to the whole subtree. And that's something to, to think about for you as an app developer. Um, so you see, we added rotation, we scaled it up a bit. Uh, we'll show this example uh, a little bit later uh, on the device. Uh, we added opacity, uh, and it affects the whole subtree, uh, both the bubble and the, uh, the text. And I'll show you the code for how to do this. It's, uh, in QML, it's dead simple. Uh, on your container, you see the container here containing the image view with the bubble, the label with the text. And you just op apply opacity, scale, and rotation. And this is what happens. Okay. Can we save the questions for later? Is that fine? And the same, as Marcus said, uh, you can use C++, you can use QML, you can combine them, you can do whatever you want. This is how it would look in C++. Uh, it's still the same, it's still the same objects you're, you're doing things to. So you, you, like, you just set the properties, but you set them in a little bit different way. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so um, animation. So we, I mean, coming from TET, we have worked with these kind of animated UIs for, I mean, for several years. I started at TET seven years ago, and this is what we did a lot back then. Um, and, and we think that animations is, is really something you need to get this, this beautiful looking UI, but the animations are also important for, for from usability point of view very often. And, and as, Important is to have animations in your UI. We believe it's, it's important for you guys as developers to, to easily create these uh, animations. Um, and things that can be animated in Cascades, it, it, virtually any property of, of the UI components can be animated. And, and I mean, the most obvious ones are the translation, which is moving things around the scene uh, or the screen, and rotation, it's um, scaling, resizing and, and fading, animating the, the, the opacity. And, and again, in, in order to make this easy for you, we have something that we call implicit animation. So this means that when you change a property of an object, very often things anima animate by default. So you don't have to write any code to get this animate, uh, animated. It just animates for you. Sometimes it can, it might be that you don't want this animation, so in those cases you can write code to switch that animation off. Uh, and, and this is what we call the, the implicit uh, animations. So, but, and if you wanna have full control, you wanna control the uh, animations and everything, we have, uh, this is what we call the explicit animations. And here you can, here we have a bunch of different classes to help you uh, work with these animations. And typical properties, typical characteristics of animations are start, and, start values and end values. It's the, it's the duration of the animation, if it's going to take 500 milliseconds or two seconds, and, it's the, and then also you can use easing curves. Sure, you can have animations which are just linear, but you can also use different kinds of easing curves to get that kind of animation shape you need to get that smooth, uh, smooth feeling. Um, and, and finally, we have 
uh, group, we support group down animations, which means that you can run, if you have several animations you want to apply, you can uh, run those either sequentially after each other or in parallel. Uh, and now I think Jonas has a, a demo to show. I do. So we're gonna show you a few of these animations and how simple they are to, to construct. Okay, hold on. I tried to push the, I didn't. So, here, <laughs> here we have that rotating car again. <laughs> and uh, so, so now if, if we switch back to the PC, you can see the, yeah, the simplicity of the QML. So, Jonas. So, the animation you just saw, it's this code running. Um, I'll explain it for you. Basically, you start by decorating a sequential animation, which just means it runs after each other. And then you, uh, you have an array with, uh, with animations. First one is a rotate animation. You go from angle zero, you rotate around the, Z, the Z axis, uh, to 90 for one second. So you get to here. And what happens is it will animate as smoothly as you just saw it. Uh, no, no choppiness, you don't have to control every step of the way or something. Um, after that's finished, we rotate from angle 90 degrees uh, for one second to zero. So we go back. So and then we have the next demo. We use a lot of cows. So this demonstrates an easing curve. Uh, so you see, see that the cow bounces, it goes from top, it bounces, and it has a, it, yeah. You see the code. Yeah. So this is how the code looks for this one. Uh, it's a parallel animation, that means they run in parallel, of course. Uh, so they run together. The first, the first animation is a translate from, uh, along the y-axis, so from zero, that's the top left of the screen, uh, to 800, and it takes two seconds. And the easing curve we use is a bounce. So that, that would, only that animation would make it bounce like this, only, only uh, along the Y axis. Then we add another one running at the same time, uh, which translates it along the X axis uh, from zero to 500 for one second, and this, Easing curve is uh, it, like it goes a bit slower in the end. So when you combine these two, you get you get this as you saw. Nice, huh? So enough of animations, events. So we have another demo. So. I shouldn't have touched it. Yes. Oh. Here we are. So this is a very sim simple application. You won't see what I'm doing, but you see that I'm pressing the bubble and it, this is what happens to it. it this application doesn't do anything else. This is a bit uh, shaky. So again, we'll show you the code for it. Here's the QML code for, uh, for how this app works. Uh, you just connect your container. Uh, this, this is a container with this bubble uh, to the on-touch signal. If you, have, if you would have had a button or some, uh, some other core control, they react to different signals. The button, for example, reacts to, to on-clicked. Um, but the, here we use the on-touch signal. Uh, and the only thing you have to do is, yeah, you check, is it down or up? Uh, and we scale and rotate. And look, look at this code and you see that we only set the properties 
scale and rotation. That's the only thing we do. And if we, we look back, do you see how nice this animates? <coughs> we only set those properties and this is how it animates using the, the implicit animations that uh, Marx talked about. In C++, if you would like to do this in C++, um, you, do, you do the same thing. It, it just gets to be a little bit more code. Uh, so here, you, what you do is you connect, uh, you connect uh, the touch signal. This is using signals and slots from Qt. So you connect the touch signal to a function that you will declare later. In this case, the touched uh, function. And the function looks like this. Again, you, you just check, is it down or is it up? Uh, you set different properties on it. So this is also a, a, an example of how easy, how easy the signals and slots concept is to use from Qt. So if you haven't read about that, you should. Layouts. Okay, so um, okay, so layouts in in cascades. Um, let's go ahead and, and start that demo. So uh, in cascades, you've already seen that that container control. So when you want to place things, if you have different buttons, your controls that you want to place in your UI, then you uh, you should use this container control. And the con container control can be given a number of different types of, of layouts. So we, we do have the absolute layout. Uh, we generally think it's a bad idea to use absolute layout un unless you really, really have to. And, um, and in addition to that one, we have the, the stack and um, uh, the stack layout and the, and the dock layout. So, and I mean, stack layout, you, most of you probably know um, what, a, what a stack layout is. You, you, you place a number of child items within the stack control and then they, these are placed in, in uh, a top to bottom direction or the reverse order or left to right or the reverse. Uh, and in, then we have the dock layout. So, and this is what you use to align things to, um, to the edges of the container or center align things. Uh, it has paddings, for example, and, and margins. margins. And, and one of the cool things with uh, having layout as a property of the container instead of having different layout container, stack layout container and so on, is that you can change the layout time in runtime. So what you see here is that we have one container with five cows and we just, in runtime, when I press the screen, we change the, the type of, uh, of the layout. And, and we talked about before about these implicit animations, so, so um, so this change of layout animates these items by, by default. Uh, and, and just a, a quick, quick look at the, uh, some, some example code for, for working with, with layout. So, so here we have the dock layout example and, and here we have two child elements. So the container is given, the, has the layout property, you give it, the, you put the, the dock layout element there. Uh, and then for these child items you, you set the, the, the horizontal and, and vertical alignment. And, and similarly for the stack layout, you give the containers layout property, uh, the stack layout element. And, and here you set the, the property of the stack layout. In this case, it's the, it's the direction of, of the, the stack layout. Here is top to bottom direction. And, and then for its child items, um, you apply the, the stack layout related properties. Here we are using the, uh, the space quota. So space quota is used to choose how you distribute the child items within that st uh, stack layout. Uh, very neat way uh, of placing things instead of using hard-coded uh, X, Y positions. Um, yeah, so now custom controls, uh, Jonas. Yes, we're ready to go into the custom controls. Because now you know everything, right? <laughs> I take that as yes. So we're going to talk about this um, this application. You may have seen it. It's one of our sample applications. Uh, we have it on our developer site. 
it's available on GitHub. You can check out the source and you can do whatever you like with it. Um, so this one, obviously, I'm gonna show it off. Do you want to demonstrate okay. it? No, I, I, can, I can try. <laughs> so this is called the speed rider. Uh, what you see here is some standard controls. Here's a text field, uh, a label. You, I think you have to write in capital letters where it is. Uh, uh, the idea is that you type the same text and this uh, control will calculate your speed. You see how it moves. Um, so there's a text field, that's standard, and that will bring up the keyboard and everything you want. Uh, there's a label, you can control a, a bit of, uh, or a, te a text field. <laughs> you can control a bit of uh, text styles and stuff like that. Good. That was difficult. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> But this, uh, this gauge uh, on top, it's obviously something custom. And you have to write something uh, of your own to, to make that happen. And uh, you see, see these, these kind of uh, controls you see in, in many applications. So we're gonna show you how simple it is to do this in Cascades. First of all, there are two, two ways you could go on doing this. We have something called a custom control. We have something called a custom component. The custom component is the easy way. You can declare your own custom component in QML. Uh, you don't have to, to write C++ code. Uh, and that's enough for most cases. That's enough for this case, for example. The calculations you need to do in order to move these needles uh, can be done in JavaScript code. Uh, but just to make this complicated, we chose to do this in C++. And you can use that when you need to reach mostly when you need to reach C++ APIs from your custom control. So, first of all, how to build this up? How do you think about this? Where do you even start? We start by creating a control called a speed gauge. Uh, as I said, we always start with a container to play something. We use a dock layout in this container, uh, docking everything to the center of the screen, or center of the container. In that uh, container, we place four different images. Uh, we have the background. We have, this might be hard to see, but this is a glass overlay, so it looks a bit more real. Uh, and we have the two needles. Everything is just centered in the, in the container. You also see that the needles aren't quite where they should be. So we add a translation to But a translation to the needles, uh, just translating them up a few pixels. So now everything is where it should be. And then whenever we need to change this, uh, we, have, uh, we have an a API that will apply a rotation to the needles. Um, and we rotate them a few degrees based on, based on how fast you type. And this is done through, through a small calculation. And it can be done in, in JavaScript. In, in this case, it's done in C++. So, the code for this. I'll, I extracted the important parts of this. What you start with is you declare your own class called speed gauge. In this case, speed gauge. Uh, which extends custom control. So, now it's a custom control. You make sure it's some uh, cute notation. You make sure it's a Q object. Uh, you make sure it, uh, the properties of it can be reached uh, via, via Qt interfaces. So here we can reach uh, the average speed and also connects a, a single. We won't use that. And then uh, we expose uh, one of the functions in the C++ code. So here we declare this as Q invocable. Q invocable means it can be reached from QML. So after you've done this, you can reach calculate speed from QML. In this case, the function calculate speed will like take the number of charts or characters since last time. It will update the needles as they should be. Calculate how much they should turn and stuff like that. 
So in your main file, this is something you just have to add. Uh, you just register your uh, class speed gauge uh, with QML so that everyone knows it's there. This is in your main file called speedrider.cpp. And for all of you writing this down now, as I said, it's on GitHub. You can reach it. So that's all we need to do in, in, uh, in C++, except for writing the actual functions and, uh, and all the code. Uh, so in QML, uh, you can reach the object by just doing this. Speed gauge, that's what it's called. Um, put an ID on it so you can reach it throughout the QML code. Uh, and you align it wherever you want. And then uh, we have a, like a few signal, signal magic in QML, but you get the signal on number of characters changed. Then you just call speed gauge, that's ID, calculate speed, that's the function we expose as Q invocable. And that's how it all happens. Simple, right? So let's go to lists. Lists. Uh, so w if you want to display something in a list, you go ahead and, and use the, the list view control that comes with Cascades. And with Cascades, you also have um, two out-of-the-box list items with, with predefined appearances. So in, in the first one is the, the standard list item component. This is the, the, the white list item that you can see here. Um, and this standard list item can be configured in, in a number of different ways. I mean, in addition to just using these labels, as you see here, you can also say that I want to have a, a, an image, and that image will, will pop up in, in, the, in the leftmost side of, of this list item. So this is something that you can use out of the box. You don't have to say anything about how things should be displayed in the, uh, in the list item, except for providing uh, the text and, and the image data. Uh, out of the box with Cascades also comes the, uh, the, the header item. So th this is also one of those standard item types um, uh, that you can use. And that is for you to use if you want to group the data in, uh, in the list. So you have get categories of, of data. So, so here you can see how we use the header item for, uh, for category and then the standard list item for, for, the, for the content. Uh, and again, talking about custom stuff, you, you can of course create your, your own custom appearance for, uh, uh, for the list items. And you can virtually use anything. I mean, go ahead, take a container, put anything you want to have in the list item as part of the, the container um, buttons or whatever. And so and let's look at a, a code example of how to use this, this list, how to implement a list and display things in the list. Uh, what we have here, is an XML file with, with some data. Um, and this data consists of um, fruits and vegetables. So the first kind of data we have here is, uh, is the, the, what we call, what we call the, the, the header kind of data. And here we have the fruits and the vegetables. The second kind of data we ha have here in this XML model is, is the fruits. And we call this the list item one kind of data. And then third, we have the, the list item two kind of data. Uh, and here you can see the code for using the list view. So the list view, um, the list view has a data model property. That's how the list view gets the data. And this data model is using an XML data model. And that XML data model is, is pointing to this particular XML file. So that's how, how you connect the XML file with, with the list view. And then we're using, yeah, uh, and then we're using the full data of type header as we define it in, in the XML file. We're using that standard header type that comes with Cascades. For, for the data of type list item one, we are using the, the standard list item that I spoke about at the previous slide. And then for data of list item two, we are imp implementing this custom appearance, which in this case is just a container and, and a label. Um, yeah, Jonas, if you can say a few words about this one. I can. So, uh, the lists in Cascades are very, very powerful. Uh, so, I would encourage you to use them whenever you can. Use them 
when you have dynamic data, you don't know how many items it's going to be. You fetch it from the web or you fetch it from, uh, from a database somewhere. Just use the list. You will get all the scrolling for free uh, and you will get most of the data handling for free. <coughs> what we're showing here is, this is kind of, kind of basic how, how it works. You have a visible area. That's what uh, Cascades will show you on the screen right now. It will cache list items on both sides. It will cache a, a few more list items in the direction you're actually scrolling because it, it knows where, you, where you're going. Uh, and then it will be loading data uh, after that and releasing before. Um, what's good about this is you don't have to worry about uh, invalidating list items. Uh, you don't have to worry about what is actually shown on screen and what's not and what do you have to fetch. All that is handled through the list view and in connection with the data source. So if you're using a standard data source, there are a few, Marks will tell you about those, uh, you, you will get all of that for free. Um, it doesn't allocate more than, than you need. If you have a list of one million items, it will still not allocate one million items. It will allocate only what's needed. Uh, if you make your own data source, you will have to build in the logic for this, but, but it's, it, everything's prepared for this. Uh, so that's how, that's how it works. So, yeah, so, so I, I showed you in the previous example how, how you connected the list view to the data model, and, and the, the kind of data model we used in that example was the XML data model. And the XML data model is, is very good for, for prototyping. If you want to just code user interface, want to try things out, want to have some uh, hard-coded data in the UI, then go ahead and use the, the XML data model. With Cascades, you have uh, a bunch of other data models uh, as well. First, we have the, the array data model, which, which if, if you're going to use, if you're going to work with just a linear set of data, then go ahead and use the, the array data model. If you have data that is more like uh, in, a, in a tree structure, go ahead and use that uh, group data model. And if you, um, and you can implement your own custom data model, so just inherit from, from the data model parent class uh, and implement your own custom data model. Uh, and one thing that is important is that with these data models, it's, we don't implement any persis persistence in these data models. If you need that or for other reasons, you can go ahead and interact with uh, JSON and, and SQL. There, there are a lot of good APIs in the platform to work with both JSON and, and SQL. Uh, we also have, have um, APIs to, to fetch this kind of JSON and uh, SQL data over uh, HTTP. So, so what you would do here in this case, if you want to get JSON data in, into the UI, then you would let either of your instances of, of these data models interact with, with the JSON um, um, data or implement your own custom data model to interact with the, the JSON APIs. Yeah. Now, now we're at the, uh, the last section of, of this presentation. It's about UI adaptability. Uh, you probably saw at the keynote today, Chris Smith talked about uh, the fact that we are introducing, not, we have the Z10 device now, and very soon there will be the Q10 device. So, and these have different characteristics. I mean, obviously the Z10 is a full touch. The QWERTY device, the Q10, has, has a smaller screen and, and, um, and a physical keyboard. And, and with UI adaptability, I mean, I mean th this is a challenge for you. I mean, you need to implement applications that run well on, on both form factors. And the effort for you to do this should be as slow as possible. You shouldn't have to implement unique code for every different form factor. And the way we kind of handle this uh, is, first of all, obviously we are resizing all the built-in controls for, uh, for this Q10 device compared to the Z10. Uh, buttons are smaller. If you take the drop-down control, for example, on the Z10, it shows five items. In the Q10, it shows three items. So, so if, you, if you're using the, uh, the core controls, you get a lot of this. It, it will look good, uh, more or less, automatically. And then we have these other features, like using the layouts. I mean, avoid using the absolute layout. Go ahead and use this stack layout and uh, doc layout and so on, and, and things like space quota. Nine sliced images to get to have images that scales well with different um, uh, resolutions, and uh, and then finally we have have this asset selection uh, um, functionality. So so the idea is that use 
reuse the code for, from, from the full touch device on the uh, keyboard device as well, but maybe there is one screen or some aspects of the application that you, that you want to give this, this um, adapted appearance. In that case, you can go ahead and just implement this subset of assets, use a, uh, use a unique subset of assets for those screens. And the way you would go ahead and do that is, um, so what you can see here is your assets for your application. If you would just go ahead and put your assets, and with assets I mean the QML files and the, the images, if you would just go ahead and put that in, in the assets folder, which is like the, a standard folder if you would create um, a Cascades project. Uh, in this case, these would <coughs> both run on, on both devices. But if you want to have a couple of assets that are unique for, for let's say, the, the QWERTY device, then you go ahead and, and create this 720 times 720 folder. Which is, which is this um, asset selector folder, and, and you will implement what's unique for the 720 times 720 device. So if you would create an application, now create a bar file and deploy this on the devices, this is what would be used and run on the full touch device. And using the same bar file on the QWERTY device, uh, these assets would be used on the QWERTY device, except for the ones that you are re-implementing like uniquely and putting in, in this asset folder. And so this kind of asset selection, they apply on, on resolution. So you can, um, uh, instead of creating a folder with 720 times 720, you can uh, type the, the resolution of, of the Z10 device uh, instead. You can also go ahead and use the, the visual style as, as the selection, uh, as the asset selection <coughs> indicator. Um, or the default style, because one difference between the full touch and, and this QWERTY device in Q10 is that the default theme, the default visual style of the full touch is the bright theme, whereas the QWERTY has the dark theme as default. So, so this is how you would use the asset selector feature. And one thing that is important is that this is a feature that comes with a, uh, this new 10.1 version of, of the NDK, uh, which is out today. Speaking of which, uh, this was a non-updated screenshot I see, but still we, yeah, go ahead and, and speak about the, yeah. our developer site. I took the screenshot this morning, so it wasn't updated yet. Uh, our developer site, please use our developer site. We built it up from scratch. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it's very, very, very good. Uh, we have lots of documentation, lots of tutorials, uh, all of the API reference. Uh, we have a bunch of sample apps that you can get inspired by. You can uh, download the source code. Uh, we have sample apps for many of the, of, the, of the system APIs and we have for most of the UI. So use our developer site. We're gonna move on to questions. First of all, these guys here, you see me and Marcus among them. These are the guys from the, from the Malmo office, the TAT office, here today and tomorrow. We, are, we really want to hear your feedback from you as developers of your experience working with Cascades. So the developer site, the, the tooling, the, uh, the APIs, all of your experiences. When you see us in the hallway, grab us and tell us what you think. So on to questions. Who has the first question? Mic. There, there's going to be a mic. There's going to be a mic. What happens if you queue an animation into the server thread before a previous animation has finished? Will they run concurrently for the remainder of the first animation? It will. I mean. Mm, let me give you an example. Okay, yeah. um, I move an element to the top of the screen and say this will take two seconds. And after one second, I queue another animation that moves it down again. And so we have one second where both animations should run concurrently. Will they or will they be queued in the, in the background? That's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
Let, let's bring the experts in afterwards and, and ask uh, about that one. I, I don't want to. I don't want to guess how, how that works. So, but the, the question was about like if you have sequential animations and you trigger them after each other. So, will the first animation uh, stop? And, tr and the other one trigger automatically, run automatically, or, or will it wait? So uh, let's look at that afterwards. I'm pretty sure it won't wait. Let's ask someone. Uh, the question is how to draw some uh, core uh, elements like animate, animated P chart, for example. So how to? How to draw a, a picture that animates? No, I how I to draw an animated P chart? Ah, oh, chart. sorry. So, okay, so um, we in Cascades we have a concept called foreign window. So, so anything that is not like uh, an image or Cascades control, Cascades objects. So you can go ahead and use this foreign window, which will, which is essentially a frame buffer, which you can in which you can draw anything. Uh, so go ahead and use libraries for drawing. OpenGL, um, for example. Yeah. So Cascades doesn't have the, the standard, uh, like, draw rectangles and circles uh, stuff. Uh, you will have use uh, OpenGL for that, or whatever yeah. library you choose. Next question. So you in the, in the back. I have a question with regards to memory management. Um, I saw there that you created a new object with new. Um, and um, I was wondering how the entire framework handles all that. Uh, I see some of the tutorial examples create objects on the stack. And lastly, uh, some of the tutorial examples, the JavaScript when the QML calls destroy on certain pages. You are very lucky. This guy <laughs> and this guy wrote almost all the sample apps. So attack them. Okay, yeah. Yeah. pretty well, but what about memory yeah. management in general? Like, should we use new? Should we create objects on the stack? When we create new, is there um, a method within the cascades to create, no, to so handle? So in, in, in general, so, okay, so how, how do you go ahead and, and, um, and use memory ma management and create objects? So if, if, you go, uh, if you're using C++ to, to create your cascades UI, I mean, it's, we haven't changed anything compared to standard Qt. So whatever applies to standard Qt uh, applies on, on, on this implementing a Cascades application as well. And what uh, applies to standard Qt? Yeah, and that's the good question. And that's, let's bring in those guys afterwards and, and discuss that in, in more detail. Okay. Thank you. So, next question. Uh, over there. In the asset resolution, can you combine the theming and the resolution stuff? So if you want to have a 720 by 720 and light and dark theme, yeah. are they, how are they handled? Okay, so, so the question is, I mentioned before about the, the asset selection that we both support the, the screen resolution as the selector and the, the style as the selector. So, and the question was, can you combine these? And the answer to that is yes. So you can, you can have folders, like uh, a style folder, at the same level in the, asset select, in, the, in the asset folders as the resolution. And, and these are implemented so that they have different priorities. And I think it's, it's the, re, the, the resolution that ha has higher uh, priority than, than the other one. But you can also choose to, to, to have a 720 times 720 asset selector folder and then in that folder put the, the style selector folder um, so, so you can nest these, uh, these selectors. Uh, next question, let's see where we are in, in time. So you have to run down to the back. <laughs> Hi, the, uh, the peak control, is that something that's only enabled once the user's drilled down a level into the application or is that something that's always there? So, um, so the question was about the peak behavior. Uh, so if, you, if the user has navigated to, uh, to some screens, so, so will the peak behavior be there automatically or not? And the peak behavior is enabled by default. So if you're using the navigation pane for, uh, for navigation, the peaking will be there for the user. 
but you can choose, as a developer, you can choose to disable this kind of peaking behavior uh, and, and switch that off. Okay, so if, if I'm at the top level of my application, um, what would that peak back to? I can, yeah. show, I can show you. Okay. So here's a football manager application. Uh, when you drill down, let's see. You can, when you swipe, you go back like this. Okay. Uh, but if you if you swipe when you're on the top level, you will bring in the the tabs. What's it called? The sidebar. The sidebar with the tabs. So yeah. that that's what the peak does when when you're on on the top level. Okay, great. Thank you. So so one, I think it's time for one final question. So um, raise your hands. Okay, so you there in, in blue shirt in the back. Uh, the question is regarding assets management. Uh, for supporting 720, 720 resolution, you added one more folder and then we were able to put assets only for that device. Is there going to be a provision that I submit different binary in app world which is specific for that, for that device? Or is it always going to be one binary which it's, uh, it's okay, so the question is that now when you're using the, the asset selective functionality to have different assets for, for the two different device types, so when you create the application, are you going to create one binary or, or separate binaries for, for the two devices? And, and that's the, the, the beauty of this, that you are creating one binary, one bar file, which will have both assets. So in runtime, the, the engine is choosing which, uh, which assets uh, it's going to use for, uh, for the device. Um, so where, where are we in, in time? So is it, yeah, we, we'd absolutely have, have uh, a couple more minutes, so let's go ahead and, and, and do a few more, uh, a couple more questions. Did we have one more in the back? Uh, there's one more in the back in the, in the corner. Hi, uh, coming from WebWorks, what is, the, is it possible to make an XHR request from JavaScript in QML? Uh, so, we are not good people to, to answer that question. To, to ask about uh, web work stuff. No, no it's not, it's not, <laughs> well, it's, it's not it's really a web, web work. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and it's, it's about Java. So what, what is really available uh, in terms of, of JavaScript APIs? It, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not obvious what you can, if you want to go ahead and implement the application in QML and JavaScript, it's not obvious what's available as, as JavaScript and what's not available as JavaScript uh, APIs. And, and that particular feature you were talking about, uh, I, I can't really answer. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that you will be able to easily just look at the API references and, and find out for, for yourself. Well, as a follow-up, is it possible to write a, that connection in QML without going into C++? Yeah, so, uh, so okay, so if, if the question is kind of uh, if you're lacking functionality in, uh, in, in, in JavaScript, if, you, if there are APIs you don't, you don't have, so, uh, or, or in QML, can you, um, how do you do to make that available? Can you implement that in C++ and expose that functionality in, in, in your, to your QML files? And, and the question is, uh, the short answer to that question is, is yes. Uh, next. Question. Or one up front. Okay, so one here in, in the front. And this will have to be the, the, last, the last question and we are waiting for, for the mic over there. Are there any examples on access in MySQL? Do you have any code examples on dynamic data from a database, My, MySQL that you can show us? Okay, yeah, so the question is do we have code examples showing how you access uh, S uh, MySQL or SQL databases, and I am, I mean, you are the expert when it comes to what kind of samples we have, but I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah, we do have samples. Uh, we had a screenshot from the, uh, the stamp collector app, right? Yeah. Uh, that uses SQL. Yeah, so, so look for the sample called XML, stamp. right? Just standard XML. Oh, no, it, it, we are, you're talking about two different things. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. But absolutely. Here is a sample app called stamp collector and that uses SQL. So yeah. Look it up on the website. Okay, so that was the final question. So thank you everyone for coming here to this session. Thanks. Thank you.